Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. It is my honor to have actor Nancy Olson Livingston, who has appeared in several plays, films, and on television. Some of her screen credits include some of the greatest films ever made, like Sunset Boulevard, uh, The Absent-Minded Professor, Pollyanna, and another film noir called Union Station. We're discussing her fantastic book today, which just came out last year, A Front Row Seat, an intimate look at Broadway, Hollywood, and the Age of Glamour. Nancy, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Robert. Robert, I have to tell you something. Yes. There is something interesting happening. The moment we became on the air, your face is gone, and now I'm reading a little... This meeting is being recorded by the host of a participant, et cetera. When oh. are you going to come back and look at me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what it is? It's because uh, Zoom is telling telling you that it's being recorded. It's or it says leave meeting or got it. Which one? Yeah, I got it. It's the one that says got it. Oh, there you are. There we go. There we go. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just giving you, uh, in case people are not comfortable being recorded, they can just say, I don't want to be recorded and hit hit the leave button, but uh, yeah, so it's kind of a warning. But now that now that we could see each other, <laughs> we could <laughs> we could jump back in. Um, I wanted to ask off the top because you you begin the book with the letter you wrote your daughters in the mid to mid eighties when your first husband Adlin Lerner died, and then. Later in the book, when your second husband, Alan Livingston, died, you wrote another letter to your son, Christopher, that I'm going to share my story and our story with uh, with both of your fathers. And and it's going to be on its way. And so you this is the, the book is basically that. So what came from what went from sharing it just with your family to wanting to then share it with the world? Uh <clears throat> I gave it to some friends who wanted to know more about my life. Plus, by the way, this took me years. I wrote that letter in 1986 right. when Alan Lerner died. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And I put the letter away for a right. couple of years. And then I found it. And I thought, you know, I think the children would like to have that history. And it's part of, you know, the world, part of changing in the world at that time. And uh, so I started to to write it. And I did it in longhand. And then I asked a young woman who was a wonderful person at the computer, and I dictated it. And I had the experience of hearing me, my voice, tell the story but I also had the experience of seeing it on, actually written and printed on the screen so that I had a sense of both, which is an odd way to write a book, I, I, I understand. But right. anyway, it, I gave it to Alan Rohde, who was a wonderful writer himself and writes about Hollywood all the time and also interviewed me. And it was such he was so in such a fabulous interviewer that I thought I'd love to know what he thinks of this. And he said, Nancy, you have to publish this book. This is part of history. And this is part of, you know, a part of a special part of history. And and you've known people of the 20th century. You not only observe them, but you actually had a relationship with them. Yeah. And so that you should definitely, this is part of history and you should have it out. And he sent it to the University of, of uh, Kentucky Press. Oh, yeah. right. And they're quite wonderful, by the way. They and, are. Yeah. Uh, and they thought about it a long time and I actually forgot about it. And then suddenly I got a phone call from Alan saying, guess what? They want to publish your book. So that it took a long time. Right. And uh, it it was an interesting experience, actually. We're, the first person I gave, excuse me, the sorry, first person I gave it to had a published successful book. And she gave it to her agent. And they, he said, 
this will never be done. So really, I let it go. And then did, Alan did, gave it. Did they say point. why? Did, did they give you any feedback as to why it couldn't be done? Um, they just, I, not really. The one thing they said was uh, we, she should definitely eliminate describing what she wore. <laughs> and I cannot tell you the reaction I get from men as well as women about my description of what yes. I wore to these various events, because it describes an era that is completely changed yes. from yes. then to today. And that they find it, they said, I can see you walking in the room. Yeah. With what the color of your dress and your shoes. <laughs> I love that as well, because I felt like I was there, as you said, just the the way people don't dress like that as much nowadays. So it, it had know, a real, not. <laughs> <laughs> it brought me right into the, uh, into the time and place. But, but like I said, I, I, I love the book and what, as I mentioned before, we started to record, uh, because of, of course I knew, knew you from these great, these masterpieces like Sunset Boulevard, but reading a memoir you uh you know particularly <laughs> of someone from hollywood and an actor it it didn't it, i never would have expected that so so quickly you didn't you wouldn't you didn't want the stardom uh that came with hollywood you know from the time you were only in your early early 20s so i i was curious now did that did did that have a lot to do with what sunset boulevard was about uh, yes you know as you said the you know, people being used as commodities and bought and sold, or was it also because, as you said, as a you know, as from the being from the Midwest, you wanted a family, you wanted children, you wanted a bigger life than just acting, uh, or is it is it just too is it too complex to sort of give a simple well, answer it, to? <laughs> it's it's a variety of of things, right. but first of all, being in my early twenties, and I was still going to UCLA when I was signed to Paramount. Uh, but suddenly my, my fellow student friends were somewhat distant. They, you know, mm. I was being groomed to be a movie star so that there was an awkward kind ofness between us. And also I was there at seven in the morning and for makeup and hair, I was on the set at nine o'clock in this huge space with walls, you know, seven feet wide right. so that the, there was no noise from the outside. And I was with a makeup man, a wardrobe woman, uh, the assistant director. And I was, where were my friends? Where was my life? Mm. Where were my relationships? And I worked until six o'clock went home just long enough to take off my makeup and shower and start working on the next day. And this was not a life. Right. This was being isolated. Mm. Plus I was being sold as this new, sexy, beautiful young woman. And I, you know, people like the, the uh, one of the uh, publicity people at Paramount said, Howard Hughes wants to meet you. Right. Well, I know about Howard Hughes and I wrote a chapter about meeting him and putting him off. But why in the world would I have to do that? Uh, why, he, it, the whole thing, a doctor's daughter from the Midwest, <laughs> from <laughs> Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was saying, wait a minute, Plus, the women stars that I observed did not have happy lives, right. personal lives. Very few had the relationship with a man that I was looking for. And That's interesting. so that put me off too. Wow, yeah. And were was it was it just boring in general too? Like were you just like Well, there was a lot of boredom, yes. Yeah. But there was also 
I must say, Sunset was fascinating. Right. Because I, I mean, Eric von Stroheim, Bill mm. Holden, who was, by the way, at the bottom of his career at that point. Right. He was being saved by Billy Wilder. Yes. And he knew it. And he was the perfect person to be cast because he was portraying Joe Gillis, who was a man who was desperate. And so was mm. Bill. Yeah. And Bill was already drinking too much. His marriage was failing. His career was not doing anything exciting or interesting. And it, he was desperate himself. And that was perfect for Joe Gillis. He was a right. desperate man who sold his soul to Norma Desmond for his survival. Right. And I, my character, by the way, one of the reasons I think that Billy cast me because uh, how he didn't really know whether I could deliver, but he wanted somebody very specific, that Betty Schaefer. And he would stop me on the lot and talk to me about what's going to UCL, UCLA like, what was growing up in the Midwest like. And because I sounded like a straightforward, educated young woman, young girl, mm -hmm. that's who Betty Schaefer was. However, Betty Schaefer also was an opportunist. She, right. recog she recognized that Joe Gillis had a gift, a talent for writing that could help her yes. and her dream, her career. Yes. Her upward mobility. And in the process, she fell in love with a man who sold his soul for survival. Right. So it's a tragedy all the way around. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's 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 I'm sure that when when you were making this film and then not long <laughs> after this, you did another film with William Holden called Union Station. To, today, people talk about those movies as being classic film noirs. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm just curious what what you think of the film noir scholarship in, in general. Does it come as a surprise to you that people were seeing these films with similar themes and similar uh, the, the structure of the script and the German expressionism and the themes? Uh, did that come as a surprise to you? I don't know if you had any opinions about the film noir scholarship I in general. I didn't th at that time really right. understand it. I remember that, first of all, my parents did not believe in my brother and I going to the movies and just seeing everything. They were very careful about what we saw. And uh, because educated people, this was important to them. Right. And there were movies being made that were about things that they didn't want us to get into. <clears throat> but I remember the first film I ever saw was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I I was struck by the beauty of it, the the incredible genius. I mean, when you saw Snow White dancing with the Seven Dwarfs, it was something unbelievable. Oh, for sure. And and then I saw a, I always forget the name of the movie, Judy Garland and um, meeting the straw man and the lion. Wizard of Oz, the Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wizard of Oz is a, is a piece of genius. Oh, yeah. And then I saw uh, Clark Gable and and uh, incredible book about the South. and the Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You know how old I am, so yeah. you know. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. But Gone with the Wind, that was movie making at a level of extraordinary genius. Oh, truly. absolutely. And <clears throat> so that, therefore, I took films seriously as a gift when you went to the theater to see something. And it, to be part of it was, I thought, fabulous. 
amazing. Mm. And by the way, Bill and I, we did four pictures together, actually. Right. And we had a friendship that was really filled with affection. And there's, I don't remember if I wrote this, uh, but there was a moment when I was married to Alan Livingston, my second husband, and we were on our way to London. And so we flew from LA to, to Kennedy and changing, we were gonna change planes to go then from Kennedy Airport to London. And we were on, we were walking down a hallway to the next gate and there was a voice at the end of the hall behind me. And it said, Nancy. <laughs> and I thought, I know that voice. And I turned around and I said, and we'd not seen each other for a couple of years. And we ran toward each other down the hall and we hugged and we kissed. And he said, my God, how are you? And I said, how are you? <laughs> you were married again. Are you okay? He said, you're married again. <laughs> anyway, and a man, this is a true story. A man walked by and tapped us on the shoulder and said, excuse me, but I just have to say something. This is better than watching an old movie. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you did. You did put that in the book. Did I? Oh, good. <laughs> I, I I couldn't help but get goosebumps when you mentioned that the building that he died in is the 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 same the Oceana. Place. Yeah, that you stayed at many times. It's uh for many years, every summer. Yeah. Wow. I know wow. it had a completion of a sad ending. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was quite uh I was quite shocked by that. Was did did uh, how did you react to to his death? Was that I I wept. Yeah, of I, course. I, bet. I was I was stunned and sad, mm. and filled with memories. Right, right. Yeah, no, he was such a he was such a fantastic <laughs> fantastic actor. I, I was curious when you were when you were studying acting in theater at UCLA. Did you learn a specific approach to to acting? Did they do like was they Stanislavski based or I don't know if you do you remember well, much the of the thing, training there? I think that the importance that one gets going to a university and and majoring in theater art <clears throat> is that you not only deal with contemporary writers but you are also dealing with Shakespeare and Moliere mm. and a different period of, of writing and expressing and thinking. And it's, it's amazing. Now, the thing about the theater <clears throat> is that the, you're dealing with a proscenium, proscenium arch. Motion pictures, you're dealing with a camera. So that you don't go to, this is, I did write this, that Alan Lerner, who was a brilliant writer, yeah. said you don't go to a bookstore to get a, to buy a screenplay. That's but you do go to get, to, to get Shakespeare. Right. Of course. Or, or Tennessee Williams. Yeah. So, uh, because it's the literature, it's the, it's the language that gives you the plot, the emotion. The camera with one close-up and one tear going down your cheek tells a whole story. Yeah. You don't have to say it. Right. You are showing your emotion, not right. expressing it. And But I think that for any budding performer, to have the university experience is really the, a big, big plus. Definitely. In in general, or for for you, do you think even actors uh, oh, that would be absolutely. a good idea? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right. You kind of dig into what the meaning of it and why to express it out loud. Mm. It's interesting. Did did you have a preference between film and and theater? I know you you were on Broadway a number of times. Did you like one more <laughs> than the other? Well, I think. Working 
with a live audience is quite an experience. Yes. Uh, especially comedy. <laughs> because if you know you if you do comedy on film, there's not an audience reacting. No, no, no. Right. So you have to be funny on your own. <laughs> That's true. And, uh, it's and also and every audience is different. So that you get a different reaction every performance, which is fascinating. And you have to learn how to not you were you're whispering supposedly on stage, but you have to hit the top balcony. Yeah. Right. So it's an it's the it's a different technique. And uh I enjoyed it. Um, the problem is that it, there's a lot of pressure and it takes away the, the time that you're, the, your social part of your day, which is having dinner with friends and spending the evening. You right. have to think of working. You get there, you know, an hour before and you put on makeup and then da, 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 and you get kind yeah. of get quiet and then you go. Right. And, um, uh, when I was finished with working, you know, at the, at the at eleven o'clock at night, I was hyped up, and everybody else wanted <laughs> yeah. to go home and go to bed. <laughs> right, right. It's a, it's such a rush after leaving the stage <laughs> in front of an audience. It keeps right. you up. <laughs> it sure does. Was it was it was it uh, difficult to adjust from theater to film when you were at UCLA doing plays and then getting on camera to then go well, from we projecting to you know, being able to just be subtle and quieter? Or was that easy for you? It, it, I had to learn it. Yeah. And it was very important that I did this awful film, Canadian Pacific, which is the first film I ever made. Right. With, um, what's his name, who was the, as old as my father. And I was playing, in, it was in color, by the way, Canadian right. Pacific. And I was playing uh, somebody who was half Indian, Canadian right. Indian, and I'm a blue-eyed <laughs> Anadavian. <laughs> and, and I said oh, to, to the to the talent department who said, "This is what you're going to do." I said, "Do I look like an Indian?" <laughs> and they said, "Oh, they're going to dye your hair very, very dark." And I I did have darker blonde hair then, but right. in the summer I had white streaks, you know with the sun and <laughs> anyway, but I learned about dealing with the camera. Right, and so it was I an education. That. Absolutely, right. it was like going to school. Mm, mm. So that when I did Sunset, I was prepared. I see. I understood how the camera worked a little bit. There's a right. long shot and there's a close up. Right. Right, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I I haven't seen Canadian Pacific yet, but uh, I, I at least oh, it don't was. Bother. Please. <laughs> at least it was a a, a learning experience for you. Uh, there was some, something you said that that was interesting uh, about your first marriage with uh, Alan Alan Lerner was uh, you 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 said that so, some 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 things you that happened to you in childhood, you, you want to learn about when you're, when you're an adult in the relationship. So you, you, you talked about him needing to sort of fall in love again and again, uh, over and over again. And, and so why, why was, was that a, per, did you ever kind of figure out why that, that was a personality type that. You well, were drawn I finally, to? I finally did understand it. And, uh, what he, the only way, <laughs> that Alan could feel Alan Lerner. I'm married to two Alans. It's, you know, <laughs> uh, Alan Lerner could feel whole. Right. Was through the eyes of somebody falling in love with him. Right. Therefore, he had to keep seducing over and over again. He was married eight times. Wow. I know. And there was a ninth in the wings, only he got cancer and died. Right. So it, but also you, you had to be a particular kind of woman 
to allow that to be for you to be uh, taken in. And I had some problems with my relationship with my mother and father. My father adored me and my mother was jealous of it. So mm. I was trying to figure out how to solve that. So I was going to fall in love with a man who was not go who was going to betray me. Oh, I see. Right. And I had went to the most amazing psychologist, Diana Kemeny, and she was incredible. And within six months, I could not fall in love with that kind of man ever again. Mm. And that's when I met Alan Livingston. And Alan Livingston would never betray me if somebody put a gun to his head. Right. And he wouldn't have interested me before. But he interested me then. Thank God. He was a, <laughs> he was a grown up. Right. That's totally. Yeah. So something that you 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 talked about was his in Alan Livingston was his instinct for being able to see great talent that people will always remember, like signing the Beatles, for example, in America, bringing Frank Sinatra's career back in the 50s when everyone thought his career was over. Where do you think this instinct of his came from? Any any idea how he was able to just spot talent so well? I, Alan Livingston had his own genius. He understood the core of the gift of the writer, the performer, the musician. When when the the uh, agent called him and said, uh, you know, would you be interested in signing Frank Sinatra? That's when Columbia let Frank go and said his career is over. It's finished. Mm -hmm. He will never sell another record. And Alan said, I would. And they said, you would? They were surprised. And Alan said, Frank is the most gifted interpreter of the American song than anyone who's recording today. And so he met with Frank, signed him to a seven-year standard contract and said, I want to put you with Nelson Riddle. I think the two of you would go together. And Alan said, no, I only work with Alex Stordle, Alex, Alex Stordle, and that's it, Alan. And typical Alan Livingston said, okay, Frank, let's put some singles out, see how we do. In the meantime, he contacted Nelson Riddle and said, uh, I'm waiting for the right song. Now, publishers, by the way, went to all these people who are running these record companies, trying to have their artists sing their songs, the publisher music, music publishing. Well, they brought Alan the song Young at Heart. Mm. And he recognized immediately that everybody was going to record it. And to get out there first was important. He called Frank. He and Alex Sorto was already recording something else in New York City. And he called Frank and he said, listen, Frank, this song, I'm going to send it to you. It's your song. You can interpret this lyric better than anyone. Alex Sorto is in New York. I have the studio on Sunday afternoon. We have to hurry and get this out. And I've got Nelson Riddle, who was willing and, and able now to uh, to do the the uh, put together, you know, the orchestration. Right. Just this once, he said. Would you please be willing to do that with Nelson? And Frank said he read the lyric. He always read the lyric first, by the way, Frank Sinatra. Well, right. Bing Crosby always listened to the music first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. And what Frank wanted to know was, what is this song about? And the lyric was the thing that interested him. Then he'd listen to the music. <clears throat> anyway, that Sunday afternoon, they recorded Young at Heart. Well, <laughs> it was off the chart. 
<laughs> I mean, it sold a million copies within a week, you know. And so there was a new relationship that Frank had with Nelson Riddle. And right. completely re-emerged his, his talent and his career. Fantastic. Were were you were you a fan of? It's interesting because you you talk about Sinatra in the book having some conflicts later with uh with your well, husband yes. Alan, and and then he was sort of turned his back on the two of you when when he's when he uh, ran into you somewhere. Was it? Were you a, were you ever a fan of any of these musicians or actors who then I, you met in life and just thought, oh God, I don't think I like your music anymore just because of this <laughs> no, no 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 i i i i love frank sinatra from the first time i heard him sing right. and when i heard heard the orchestrations of nelson riddle and the combination of the two i mean what could be more wonderful to listen to oh so and good. so uh but what happened was that alan left capital and went to nbc television and um NBC, by the way, wanted to get rid of Allen at Capitol because Capitol was taking over the whole record industry because of Allen. So, and Allen thought maybe the record business is something I don't want to stay with forever. So he went to NBC television and ran the, he was the president, the vice president of tele in uh, representing LA. And he created Bonanza. Mm. Yes. Wow. And it's amazing all he did. It's incredible. And but the, and gave it its title. Had his brother Jay do da 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 da, da, da you know. Yes. And but the head of television in New York was somebody who had a problem with alcohol and ego, and he was buttering up Bobby Sarnoff, who was the president of the whole RCA, you know, empire. His father, General Sarnoff, was the one who started the whole thing. And Alan heard he was trying to sell Bonanza to an advertiser on Madison Avenue, and they kept turning him down. And then finally, somebody who was a friend of Alan's called him and said, Alan, you have to understand something. The president of NBC television, this very odd difficult man has told everyone that anything alan livingston brings is dead on arrival wow people's egos are something yeah. aren't they unbelievable but guess what happened alan went to general sarnoff who was who always admired alan mm -hmm. and said i have to leave and told him the story and he said look Alan." he said bobby is my son. He likes this man. I cannot interfere with that. So he said, I'll do you a favor. He said, I promise. We will put out the first nine episodes and we will own them. We will not get a advertising person to be the producers. We will put out, it'll be owned by NBC. Well, it became the number one possibly the one of the most valuable properties that they've ever had they did something like 14 years wow can you imagine? unbelievable but <laughs> Alan, i truly am very disturbed at that memory and also many people at capitol records because then alan went back to capitol and right. signed the beach boys the beatles the band please uh, started a <laughs> classical label uh, but there were people with knives out who resented Alan and Alan was this focused person on talent and what made it happen and how to bring it into the public right this was his gift and he wasn't looking to say what 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 is he, what are you, why are you holding that knife? Right. People's egos, it reminds me very much of politics today. Yes. I know it's, it's so, it's so petty just to 
want to destroy people because they might or, get ahead of you. Yes, yes. Wow. It's truly, uh, and I don't see the world growing up. Mm, it's very, it's very childish. Yes. Wow. I, I was, I was actually on the topic of of politics. One one thing <laughs> that that was was interesting in the book was that you that your you Alan Livingston you, you mentioned uh, was a Republican and you you're a you're a Democrat and you also got along well with other you know John Wayne who was Republican and Fred McMurray and even had a relationship with the Reagans um it's interesting because it see it my my impression today is that the people on the the left or the right cannot find any common ground or get along at all so I, I was oh. curious how did you how did you get over or beyond just political views and and still have good relationships with people alan was a alan livingston was a wonderful human being and yet i think being responsible for a large company uh the emphasis was on helping that company grow and not having the Democrats come in and take away <laughs> that process. Right, right. And, or slow it down. <laughs> and um, that, but listen, he his final, his last vote before he died was for Obama. Oh. So good. that was, that, <laughs> <laughs> that made me very happy, I must say. Yes. I never quite forgave him for voting for Reagan, because it it was too obvious to me right. that Reagan was not the person to be president. Mm. How, how did how did you how were you able to still get along with with them? Uh, were were you were you able to just put politics aside, or, or is everybody that hard? knew? I know I was very outspoken. Right, everybody knew that I was a <laughs> a very. <laughs> Moderate, no, maybe a little to the left of being a Democrat. I'm, you know, I'm basically in the middle, but more shifted. I more definitely am over more to the left than to the right. That's for sure. Right, right. Um, it, they accepted me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, for different reasons, I mean, I was then the president of Blue Ribbon and I was being written about every other week in the right. LA Times. And so was Alan. And so therefore we had a image in the community I see. that was desirable. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really, that's what it boils down to. I see. Oh, I see. I see. Did you, did you like Ronald and, and, and Nancy personally? Were you, were, did you find them <laughs> fun to be around or... <laughs> What, well, what you know, like? I I met them when Ronnie was uh, really diminishing. He was beginning dementia. And I would be at a dinner party, small dinner party with him. And uh, he would tell a joke at the din dining room table. And then he'd get up. And then later he'd say he'd get his group together and say, I got to tell you a great joke. And he'd repeat himself. Mm hmm. So as I, you know, I had that experience of writing a script for him at one of the Blue Ribbon events and he showed up and he, he shocked Nancy, he shocked the audience. It was a huge success. I couldn't believe it. I wrote the script, had a close, one of the Reaganites take it to him and his secretary. And he said, I will do this if, you that Nancy doesn't find Nancy Reagan, his wife, does not find out, and that no one knows this except Nancy Livingston, Joanne, the president, the people backstage at the taper. That's it. Right. And when the the when the, the stage manager came back at the back of the theater and gave me the signal that Ronnie was in place. We were there with questioning Nancy about, you know, life. And uh, I said, excuse me, I just have to ask a question. I just a burning question. Nancy, 
Mrs. Reagan, every photograph that you have ever been in with the president, you look at him with such adoration, such love, such concentration. I said, do you actually feel that way every time? And then a voice from backstage says, Nancy, before you answer that question, <laughs> I'd right. like a word with you. And he came out. I love that then, story. Oh, my God. The audience <laughs> was, that was the end of it. We all went to lunch with Nancy mm. Reagan. But Nancy was, oh, but we had breakfast. And, and, and you never mentioned this. And, and, and then he took her down to center stage, put his arm around her. I'll never forget. And he said, when this lady leaves the room, I miss her. <laughs> and the audience went, ah. and that was the end. So Alan, that evening, he knew all about this and, you know, was helping me with the script and, we, you know, the whole thing. He was fascinated. And we had our little drink together, which we had every night before dinner right. with some, you know, his record in the background he used he liked the violin concertos i liked the piano concertos because those were the instruments we played and he said okay tell me about it what happened and i said alan before i tell you i have a question if i left the room would you miss me <laughs> <laughs> and, he left me, and he said nancy you're coming back, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's another great story in the book. <laughs> so many wonder, so many wonderful stories. Well, one thing that I really liked the book was was liked about the book was how much you talk about others. Uh, it's not just about it's not just about you. It's like all these people that we're discussing and your children and uh, all these stories, which is so again, which is not. Uh, as common with memoirs uh, that I've really? read anyways. Yeah, I mean, maybe they are, but at least maybe not Hollywood ones. <laughs> you know, it's it seems to be more about that. Uh, I mean, obviously this is your experiences in your life, but there's, 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 it's so large. There's so many, there's so many characters and your interest in others, which I found quite um, fascinating. Well, that, that's what was, that's what has been interesting about my life. Yeah. Right. is that I have known and had relationships and experiences with some of the most interesting people in the world. Right, which goes and, into the title of Front Row Seats. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had a conversation with my friend, Scott Berg, who is the writer, the uh, biographer. And uh, he said, well, Nancy, he said, well, I told him I was writing this and I said, I wonder maybe someday it's, it'll get published. Who knows? And he said, but, you know, you should be writing it because you always had a front row seat. And I said, right. Scott, you've just given me the title. That's perfect. Such a great title. I love it. A front row seat. Uh, I, I was curious if you had any any favorite films. Is there any is there any movies you like to see again and again? No. But I'll tell you something. Uh, Snowball Express, which is not a great movie, is the last picture I did at Disney. Right. It's not a great script, so it doesn't really work. You've got to have a script. Right. And. <clears throat> uh, but. I have never looked as well in any movie before or whenever today <laughs> as I looked in every single shot of that movie. And that kind of fascinated me. And I don't see it, but I, the other night, oh, years, a couple of years ago, it was on it, you know, on one of the late things and, uh, somebody turned it on and I sat and watched it and thought how sad that it was such a poor, poorly written script. And 
I looked amazing. That's the only film that I really felt that way about. Um, I, it's interesting, but how you look has always been a part of the mystery of my life because my mother kept saying over the years, you're not nearly as pretty as everyone tells you you are. And so I was wondering, I never thought I was. Right. So, so it's always been a little bit of an obsession because I, I, I will say when I dress up and go out, do I look okay? Mm. But it isn't because I want a compliment. It's because I really want to know. <laughs> right, right. So strange. When, when was that film roughly? That I, that one I haven't seen. It was after uh, the absent minded professor and the next, you know, we did a sequel to the app, which was awful. The absent minded professor is truly, absolutely a fabulous film. Oh, yeah. I love that. Not one. because of me, but because it's just a great film. You you had great you the chemistry between you and Fred McMurray, I thought was <laughs> was great. You were both playing off each other so uh so beautifully. <laughs> I really liked that one. And I, I also just saw for the first time, and my wife said she loved it ever since she was a kid, was Pollyanna. That is such yeah. a great, great film. It is truly. And you know. I was I thought I was never going to make another film ever and didn't care. And right. I was in Mallorca and I get a call from the Walt Disney for God's sake, what? And he said, look, we're making we're going to now go from not just our animation. <coughs> Excuse me. But he said, we are now going to do a film that we're going to spend more money on. And he said, every character is well known i mean is a really established actor agnes moorhead and carl marx and carl malden or no yeah Nate. that's right yeah carl you malden yeah. yeah and uh of uh, jane wyman and it went on and on and he said we want you and i said well when are you going to do it and he said at the end of august I was coming to California with my two children to be with my, at the Oceana, wow. with my two children to be with their their grandparents. My parents now lived in Brentwood Park, very near the Oceana. And I said, well, I'm coming there anyway. And uh, it's not a huge demanding role, he said, you know. And so I said, oh, sure, I'll do it. And that's how it began to progress at Disney. Once I did that, they, the, then they went into the absent-minded professor. I see. Yeah, because that was just before, I believe. Pollyanna was just before absent-minded professor. Right. It was made yeah. first. And then the next summer, living at the Oceana again, again right. in August. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> before the children had to come back to New York and go to yeah. school. So anyway. Yeah, it no, was... it's such a, it's such a wonderful film. I I wanted to show show it to um to my son that he <laughs> he didn't want to watch it, and then he found himself getting drawn into it. Yes. <laughs> he was on the computer, and then suddenly he wanted to watch it. So I think it's wonderful for <laughs> children and adults. Uh, wonderful family film. I just had uh, one last question. I I was curious when you're when you were writing the book and looking back on your life, was there anything that um that you learned about yourself that just hadn't dawned on you before? Anything that was in your part of your subconscious that suddenly became conscious? Or I'm sure maybe it was a lot of things, but <laughs> anything come to mind? Um, you know, it was important for me in writing the book to be as honest about my experiences and how I felt as I could possibly be because I was writing to my children right. and my grandchildren. And so I wanted them 
to really experience what I felt was important that I experienced. And so that was a very motivating factor. Uh, it was hard for me to end the book. I didn't know how. Mm. And then I came up with the idea that we all arrive with an empty canvas. Yeah, I love that. And and accompanied with, you know, a palette of colors, which represents our background, our IQ, our temperament, our shape of our nose. Mm -hmm. And we start painting, but other people start painting on our canvas as we interact with their palettes and their yes. colors. Yes. And I, I said that almost at the end, that my canvas is almost finished. But you recognize that that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what's fascinating when I began to think about this is that everybody, and there's so many people in the world, their canvas is totally different and unique. And that's how I finally had to end it. I, yeah, I love that. Such a great, such a great metaphor for life, the way the way you put it. I thought it was a perfect ending. So what a fantastic read. Again, I really, really enjoyed it. And for anyone who is a classic Hollywood fan or just a theater fan or and even if you like books, it's <laughs> politics, there's so much music. Uh, there's so much packed into this. So I highly recommend checking out Nancy Olson Livingston, a front row seat. Nancy, thanks so much for coming on and and sharing your this your story with the world and sharing the last hour with me. So I really appreciate your your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. If this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.